Consequently, Rousseau develops the notion of the general will. But from the notion, the harmless notion of a contract, which after all is a semi-commercial affair, which after all is merely a kind of undertaking voluntarily entered into, and I suppose ultimately revocable, by which human beings come together and agree to do certain things which will uh, lead to their common happiness, but which, if it leads to their common misery, they can, of course, abandon, from the notion of a social contract as a perfectly voluntary act on the part of individuals who remain individuals and who pursue each his own good, you gradually, in Rousseau, get the notion of the general will as almost the personified willing of a large, superpersonal entity, of something called the state, which is no longer the crushing Leviathan of Hobbes, but which is now something like a team, something like a church, some kind of unity in diversity, something which is a greater than I, something in which I think my personality only in order to find it again. It's, it, there is a kind of mysterious moment at which he mystically passes from the notion of a lot of individuals in voluntary free relations to each other, each pursuing his own good, to the notion of submitting to something which is greater than myself, which is myself and yet greater than myself, the whole the com community. The steps by which he reaches it are peculiar and worth examining for a moment. I say to myself that there are certain things which I desire, and if I'm stopped from having them, then I'm, I'm not free. And this is the worst thing which can befall me. I then say to myself, what is it that I desire? I desire the satisfaction of my nature. Well, if I'm wise, and if I employ reason, then I discover in what this satisfaction lies. The true satisfaction of any one man cannot clash with the true satisfaction of any other man, for if um, it clashed, nature would not be harmonious, and one truth would collide with another, which is logically impossible. Now, uh, it may be that other men are trying to frustrate me. Why are they trying to frustrate me? If I know that I am right, if I know that what I seek is the true good, then people who oppose me must in some way be in error about what it is that they seek. No doubt they think they're seeking the good, they seek their own liberty, but they're seeking it along the wrong path. Therefore, I have a right to prevent them. In virtue of what have I right to, this right to prevent them? Not because I want something which they don't want. Not because I am superior to them. Not because I am stronger than they are. Not even because I am wiser than they are. For they are human beings with immortal souls, and Rousseau passionately believes in equality. It is because if they knew what they wanted, they would seek what I seek. The fact that they don't know doesn't mean that they don't really know. It is the word real, which is really the treacherous word here. To, what Rousseau really wishes to convey is that every man is potentially good. Nobody can be altogether bad. If they allowed the natural goodness to well out from them, then they would want what is right. Now, the fact they don't want it merely means that they don't understand their own nature. But the nature is there. To say that a man, for Rousseau, to say that a man wants what is bad, although potentially he wants what is good, is the same as to say that in some secret part of himself, with his real self, if he were himself, if he were as he ought to be, if he were his true self, then he would seek the good. And from that it is but a small step to saying there is a sense in which he already seeks this good, but doesn't know it. It's true that when he, if you ask him what it is he wants, he may enunciate some very evil purpose. But the true man inside him, the immortal soul, that which if only he allowed nature to penetrate his breast, if only he lived the right kind of life, he would realize what his true self, that self, seeks something else. Now I know what the true self seeks, for it must seek what I seek, for I know that what I am now is my own true self and not my own illusory self. It is this notion of the two selves which really operates in Rousseau's thought. And therefore, when I do, when I stop him from pursuing his evil ends, even when I put him in jail in order to uh, prevent him from causing damage to other good men, even if I execute him as an abandoned criminal, I do this not for utilitarian reasons, but in order to give happiness to others, not even for attributive reasons, in order to punish him for the evil that he does. I do it because that is what his own inner, better, more real self would have done if only he had allowed it to speak. And so I set myself up as the authority, not merely over my actions, but over his. And this is what is meant by the famous phrase in Rousseau about forcing men to be free. To force a man to be free is to force him to behave in a rational manner. A man is free who gets what he wants. What he truly wants is a rational end. If he doesn't want a rational end, he doesn't truly want. If he doesn't want a rational end, what he wants is not true freedom, but false freedom. I force him to 
do certain things which will make him happy. He will be grateful for it to me if ever he discovers what his own true self is. That is the famous doctrine. And there is not a dictator who in years after Rousseau did not use this monstrous paradox in order to justify his behavior. From, from the Jacobins, Robespierre, Hitler, Mussolini, the communists all use this very same method of argument of saying men do not know what they truly want by wanting it for them, by wanting it on their behalf. We really are giving them what, in some occult sense, without knowing themselves, they want. In short, when I execute the criminal, when I bend human beings to my will, even when I torture them and I kill them, when I organize inquisitions, I am not merely doing something which is good for them, though that is dubious enough. I am doing that which they truly want, that they may deny it a thousand times. If they deny it, it is because they do not know what they are, what they want, what the world is like. And thus I speak for them on their behalf. This is Rousseau's central doctrine, and this is a doctrine which leads to genuine servitude. And in this way, from this deification of the notion of absolute liberty, we gradually reach the notion of absolute despotism. There is no reason for human beings to have choices, to have alternatives, when only one alternative is the right alternative. Certainly they might choose it, because if they don't choose it, then they're not spontaneous, they're not free, they're not human beings. But if they don't choose it, if they choose the wrong alternative, it is because their true self is not at work. They do not know what their true self is, whereas I, who am wise, who am rational, who am the great benevolent legislator, I know. And Rousseau, who had democratic instincts, lent not so much in favor, not so much towards individual legislators as towards assemblies. Assemblies which, however, were only right to the extent to which they um, they willed to the extent to which they resolved to do that which um, reason inside all the members of the assembly, their true self, genuinely desired. It is for this doctrine that Rousseau lives. It is, this is evil and the good that he did. The good in the sense that he stressed the fact that without freedom, without spontaneity, no society is worth having. That a society such as it is conceived by the utilitarians of the 18th century, in which a few experts or specialists um, organize life in a smooth and frictionless manner so as to endow the largest number of people with as much as happiness as possible is repulsive uh, to um, a human being who often prefers wild, unruly, spontaneous freedom, but provided it is he who acts to even the maximal happiness if that means that he somehow worked into an artificial system, not by his own will, but by the will of some manager, of some arranger of society. The evil that Rousseau did consists in this mythology of the real self, in the name of which I can coerce people. No doubt all inquisitors and all religions justified their acts which subsequently may have appeared to some people at any rate cruel and unjust, but at least they invoked supernatural sanctions for it. At least they invoked sanctions which reason was not allowed to question. Rousseau, who believes that this can be discovered by mere untrammeled human reason, by mere untrammeled observation of the actual nature, of actual three-dimensional nature, of, of, of nature in the sense in which it simply means objects in space, human beings, animals, and inanimate objects, Rousseau is the author of the monstrous paradox whereby liberty is a kind of slavery, whereby to want something is not to want it at all unless you want it in a certain special way, in which you can say to a man, you may think that you are free, you may think that you are happy, you may think that you want this or that, but I know better what you are, what you want, what will liberate you, and so forth. It is this monstrous paradox, according to which a man, in losing his political liberty and in losing his economic liberty, is in some way liberated in some higher, deeper, more rational, more natural sense which only the dictator, or only the state, or only the assembly, only the authority knows, in which the most untrammeled freedom coincides with the most rigorous and um, enslaving authority. For that paradox, Rousseau is more responsible than any thinker who ever lived. The consequence of it is the 19th and 20th century I need not enlarge upon. They're still with us now. And in that sense, it is not paradoxical to say that Rousseau who claims to have been the most ardent and passionate lover of human liberty who ever lived, 
who tried to throw off every shackle, the shackle of sophistication, of culture, of convention, of science, of art, of everything, whatever, because all these things somehow impinged upon him, all these things in some way arrested his natural liberty as a man, but Rousseau, in spite of these things, was one of the most sinister and the most uh, influential, uh, most sinister and the most formidable enemies of liberty in the whole history of modern thought. <laughs>